I'm Bean and she's Chickpea. And of course, uh, I'm Mexican, so I'm the Bean and she's a Chick. So she's <laughs> Chickpea. And that's why we're Chickpea and Bean. And it was the food that literally changed our lives. So we knew that we had to make sure that we, uh, the, the nonprofit we started had the food names in it. So um, I'm sorry, let me, I'm going to have to just, uh, I got this. I get, I'm getting this, uh, hold on one second. Okay, there we go. I was, I was getting a pop up here about the recording. So, so yeah, so let's get started. First, we start with our disclaimer and basically it states that the information and materials presented here are provided for general information purposes and may not be relied on as a substitute for actual medical advice, care or treatment. Nothing we say may be used for diagnosing or treating a health condition and it's not a substitute for professional medical diagnosis or treatment. And you're encouraged to consult your physician, nutritionist, or dietitian to obtain professional medical advice, which may agree or disagree with the information provided here. And please remember everyone eating vegan or plant-based should take a B12 supplement. Yeah, so we're coming to you with a message of hope, right? Do you want to tell them basically what, how, what we're going to roll through here? Kim? Right, so first Mark is going to share his personal story. I think you're going to enjoy it. He's very passionate and loves to share it. And then after that, I'm going to chime in and I will share more of the how we do it. I'm going to give you examples of some foods in our pantry and recipes we make. So if you're ready to try going plant-based, you can... We can lead the way with that. And if you're already plant-based, there's still a lot to learn here. So let's get started. Yeah, and in between there, there'll probably be, we're going to try to share a little, um, just a little trailer on a new documentary that's coming out soon. Mm -hmm. So you'll also, we're going to try to share that in between these two uh, presentations. Mm -hmm. So here's a picture of our wedding day back in July of 1992 is that right am i right <laughs> yes uh oh i almost forgot that 1992 so this is us on our wedding day you see this is this photo is of my side of the family so this is all of my brothers and sisters including my mother the arrow is above my oldest brother david now unfortunately david died at the young age of 41 after a nine month bout with pancreatic cancer david was also diabetic for almost a decade he had high blood pressure high cholesterol so chronic disease right Next is my little brother, Martin. Now, Martin is five years younger than me. I'm 54, he's 49 years old. But Martin was diagnosed with diabetes at a very young mm -hmm. age, 13 or 14 years old. So he's had it approximately 36 years. Now, Martin has had his right leg amputated. He's had a pancreas and two kidney transplants. He's been legally blind since 2004. He's had a heart attack. He was on dialysis for a decade. I mean, you name it, and Martin has uh, has been through it when it comes to uh, diabetes. Um, so he's 49 years old, like I said. Next is my mother, uh, Carol. My mom had diabetes for over 33 years. She also had a kidney transplant, two heart attacks, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and ultimately uh, passed at the young age of 61. She had two of her coronary arteries were blocked, so she went in for a double bypass in, at Rush Presbyterian Hospital in Chicago, and unfortunately never recovered and passed at the young age of 61. Uh, next is my little sister, Sandra. Sandra is two years younger than me, so she's approximately 52 years old. Sandra's been diabetic approximately 20 years, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, multiple medications. Uh, my sister Jill, she's the only one right now. She's teetering back and forth between is she diabetic or not. So she's she's on that verge, but she's the one. Um, I remember I mentioned my mother had a kidney transplant. That kidney came from my sister Jill. So uh, she had <laughs> one of her kidneys. My oldest sister Carol, now Carol was diabetic for approximately five years or so. And once she saw what Kim and I did in the way of adopting a low-fat plant-based lifestyle, she changed her foods dramatically and was able to eliminate her, her metformin medications or diabetes medications. Last but not least is my twin brother, Joe. There are two of us, the evil twins. Uh, no, we're not evil, I promise. But, uh, but 52, we're, we're 54 years old. Joe's been diabetic about 22, 23 years. He's high blood pressure, high cholesterol. So when you look at my entire family, Everybody in this photo has battled chronic disease with the exception of Kim and my sister, Jill. Uh, so everybody here is sick, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, high cholesterol, multiple medications, just a slew. And, and I grew up believing, hey, this is just in my genes. You know, 
my whole family's diabetic. The doctors are telling me my, my family history and you're going to have diabetes because your whole family has diabetes and it's genetic and there's nothing I can do about this. And that's what I thought. So let's take a little peek at what chronic disease and illness looks like. My little brother, 25 medications. This is what he wakes up and stares at every morning. Now, he was able to eliminate a few of these when he got his second kidney transplant. I think about seven of these medications were able to go away. But he's still 16, 17, 18 medications every single day. Now, I, I put this up here as a caution because I'm going to share some photos of you know some of the my brother's journey and it's of his amputation. So I put this caution up there in case people are eating or maybe they don't have they they don't like seeing um, you know photos of amputations. But this these are all pictures of my little brother, and he told me to share them if it'll help you know share the story. So he caught a blood blister on the top of his right foot. They cleaned out the infection, but two of the toes were turning purple. So they took his four toes. So this is what taking four toes and amputation looks like. And you can see at the bottom there, his ankle is, is there, but it's all swollen. It's not healing properly. So within a few days, I think it was three days later, it wasn't healing right. They had to go take the leg just below the knee. So within a few days, he has two amputations, one of his the four toes and then the second one of is um, just below the knee. So that happened within a week in the summer of 2011. Now, he was also on dialysis for a decade while he was waiting for his second kidney. And this is going in, plugging into this machine, having it clean out your blood. And, uh, you know, it, it's a four hour process, three times a week. Afterwards, you know, you're not feeling well. There's a lot of throwing up involved in this whole process. And, and he did this for a decade, for 10 years, he was on dialysis. So. We're very lucky and fortunate that he did obtain his second kidney. Now, recently, his only good foot, his left foot, he tripped and fell and broke his foot in two spots. So now they were fusing the bones together. And again, he's been blind since 2004. So that's not, you know, we all have accidents and trip and whatnot here. But of course, being blind, that doesn't help him either. He's been blind since 2004. And this is now they're trying to save this foot in hopes that they don't have to amputate his second, his only leg that he has left. And again, I, I didn't mean to shock anybody, but that is the long-term effects of diabetes. When you look at the dialysis centers, amputations, transplants, diabetes is the leading, leading cause of all of that, of, of much of that anyway. So while my family was back in Chicago, uh, unfortunately getting sicker and sicker year over year, I had the fortunate opportunity to earn a football scholarship and come play at the University of Michigan the greatest university on this planet. But I, I was a right guard. I was 305 pounds. I'm 6'2", so I was a big guy, right? And I grew up believing, hey, you need to eat a lot of meat for protein and chicken for protein to get big and strong. You need to eat these foods. And that's what I thought. So about 12 years, 11 years out of college, um, uh, actually, this is, I'm sorry, this is about seven or eight years. This is 2007 or so. But you can see here, I'm not working out anymore like I was at Michigan. I'm, I continue to eat like a football player and my body is starting to transform. My belly is getting bigger. My face is getting bigger. My muscles are getting smaller because I'm not working out to the degree that I used to. Uh, you can In this picture, I'm approximately 280 pounds. Uh, you can see Kim and I have started our family with our daughter and my little son. If we fast forward to 2000 and 11. Here I am on, it's April of 2011. We're on a cruise. We're in, a, in our room getting ready to go out to dinner. And here's, I'm about 260 pounds in this photo. And you can see my belly. I'm kind of busting at the, at the seams there on the pants. Cheeks are kind of chubby. And again, about 260 pounds. But it's at this point that I have already been diabetic approximately a decade, almost 10 years. I'm on Lantus insulin shots. I'm on metformin and Genuvia, all for diabetes. I'm on a, a, a statin drug for cholesterol and lisinopril for high blood pressure. And on top of that, I'm obese. I don't sleep well. I have psoriasis all over my scalp. I have heartburn all the time. So at 43 years old, I was just a hot mess. And every year, it seemed like I was just getting a little worse. So I saw myself heading down that same trajectory as my little brother and my mother just getting sick. And I saw my, my future of amputations, blindness, transplants, etc. So I knew I needed to make a change. And that's because I have two children. I want to see, 
I want to see my grandkids. I want to see my grandkids go to college. I want to see my grandkids get married and God willing, my great grandkids, right? When we, when Kim and I had our daughter, we took her to introduce her to my mother in Chicago. My mom was already blind. Mom, all she could see was a silhouette. She couldn't see the color of her eyes, the lines on her face. She was already blind. I did not want that to happen to me. So what did we do? Well, Kim's parents gave us a documentary by the name of Forks Over Knives. That also came out in 2011. They gave it to us. It sat on, sat on the shelves for a little bit. And, uh, and then at some point, uh, basically, my brother went through his, his uh, amputation. I had my worst A1C in 2011. Um, and I see myself headed down that same path of amputations, blindness, transplants. I'm feeling somewhat depressed. And so we decided to break out the documentary. We watched it. And from there, we were introduced to Dr. Neil Barnard. And he has this book, Dr. Neil Barnard's Program for Reversing Diabetes. So we read that book and basically implemented really that day, December 3rd of 2011, a low-fat plant-based lifestyle. And it was amazing the results that we were seeing within days of adopting this lifestyle as it pertains to my blood glucose levels. So this here is a picture of my blood work during this time frame that Kim and I made this change. On the left, you have a photo that's from September of 2011. And on the right, it's December of 2011 because as diabetics, we go to the doctor every three months, right? And we get our results. Let me zoom in a little bit so we can see closer. If you look at the top photo, this is from September. You look at my total cholesterol, 164, triglycerides, 192, HDL, 39, and LDL, 87. Now, mind you, I'm taking simvastatin to keep these numbers in check, my cholesterol levels, right? But at the bottom of that top photo, you see my hemoglobin A1C, and it's 10.5. It's practically double that of a non-diabetic. Now, I'm, on, I'm taking insulin shots, I'm on all these medications, and my numbers are still terrible. So Kim and I adopt this lifestyle, a low-fat plant-based lifestyle, on December 3rd of 2011. And in 26 days, it's time for me to go get my checkup, right? Because I go every three months. So we adopted a, this lifestyle, and in 26 days, we were able to, my cholesterol plummeted 60 points to 104. My triglycerides dropped by 81 points to 111. My HDL was was about the same, 38. And then my LDL, the lousy cholesterol that we hear about, that was cut in half to 44. And most impressively to me, my hemoglobin A1C dropped to 8.1. It dropped two and a half points, which in my decade of being sick and trying to, you know, trying to count carbs and count calories and portion control, nothing seem to work like this worked. So uh, we decided to just stick with it. I saw within days my glucose levels plummeting. Remember those pants when I was on the cruise, uh, when we were on our cruise and on vacation in Mexico? These are those same pants three months later. I ended up losing 50 pounds in three months. I dropped down to 210 pounds. Uh, again, I'm 6'2", so it's 210 pounds. And this is what I weighed in fifth grade. Fifth grade was, and I weigh, I actually lost a few more now with with COVID and staying home and eating, not, not going to any restaurants, I lost another 15-ish or so pounds. I'm down to 196, which is, again, about fifth grade weight. But uh, this is what happened in three months. And, you know, I always get the question about protein and are you getting enough protein? Well, here I am a decade into this lifestyle. I think I'm doing okay with protein. So, yeah, so when I go to the doctor now, uh, these are my results. You see my total cholesterol at 136. My HDL's at 40, triglycerides 92, LDL 77, non-HDL 96, uh, and then my, my fasting glucose was 95. So all normal levels, right? Everything looking good uh, and, in, and in great shape. And again, I've been, I, I lost 50 pounds in three months. I was off all my medications in two months. And here we are over a decade in, still off all the medications and still doing good. And here's a little picture, you know, in my opinion, if if the FDA were really doing their job, we'd take the Chihuahua, we'd take the Colonel, we'd take the Clown, the King, right? And we'd throw them in jail and never let them out because, quite honestly, a lot of these foods are what's causing a lot of the issues and the problems that we have uh, with as it pertains to, you know, our health here in the United States and really all over the world. And this is a part of the presentation where I ask people to just take a step back and start thinking about things. And I ask them, I say, does... Do you see anything crazy or abnormal in this picture? Does anything look off to you? And most people, they just say, well, no, it's mama cat feeding her kittens, right? Everything looks fine. So I agree, that's a normal picture. How about here? Does anything look strange or off or different? No, this is just the baby calf taking nourishment from mama cow. Everything is normal. 
What about here? So they look off or different. <laughs> you know, we are the only mammals that go and take secretions from another mammal as fuel or food, right? You don't, you would not drive into the jungles of Africa and find a gorilla taking nourishment from an elephant. That just doesn't happen. That's not normal. Our, our fuel and the best fuel for humans are milk from mama's breast, right? After we're born. That's, that's what we're designed to eat. We're not designed, we're not cows, we're humans. When we look at this advertisement from back in the 60s or 70s, you know, 60s, 50s, here you have a medical professional that's basically saying, hey, give your throat a vacation and smoke a fresh cigarette, right? We know that cigarettes cause cancer and there's problems. And in my opinion, if you really think about it, the, um, the food industry is exactly where the tobacco industry was some decades ago. And you used to be able to buy cigarettes right at your bedside in the hospital, right? We know you can't smoke in the hospitals anymore. You have to go outside, right? It's not good for you. Same thing here with the food. And back to the protein, just real quick. When you think about protein, right? We, everyone asks me, that's one of the first questions or one of the first questions we usually get. And that's, well, where, where am I going to get my protein from? And I, I tell them, time out. Let's stop and look at the gorilla, right? When you look at the gorilla, the gorilla shares the same DNA as a human being to 98.3%. They're almost human from a genetic standpoint. And guess what? Gorillas don't eat meat and they don't drink milk except when they're young from their mother. Where are they getting their protein? Wait, where, so do y'all eat meat? Where are they getting their calcium from, right? They're getting- I, I love meat. I love I love meat. Meat takes world. So um, the other thing too, if you take it another step further, right? The elephant, the giraffe, the rhinoceros, the bull, the stallion, the largest land animals on this planet, guess what, folks? They don't eat meat and they don't drink milk either. Where do they get those big muscles and those big skeletal structures from with their calcium and their protein? They're getting it from plants, the same place we've been getting it for, for over a decade now. And what's ironic to me is people say, just like some of these folks are chiming in, I love meat. Well, they, they look at the meat and they say, well, that's where I get my protein. And they're getting it most, most often from a cow. What do cows eat? They're not eating organic grass-fed beef. They're eating corn and soy and grains. They don't eat meat either. So it's kind of ironic that we sit here and say, I need a piece of meat for protein, uh, when you really don't. You get all the protein you need from the plant-based world. So this is our family. We, we talked about all the chronic illness and disease that's devastated, really, uh, my family. And I share it because I, I hope that as you look at your future families, here's a more recent photo. My daughter just got married a couple years ago. We now have a, grandchild, a grandson. And nobody in this photo is dealing with any chronic disease. So, so again, we're hoping that we have turned that corner to being one, a family of a lot of chronic illness and disease to one of future, you know, hope and prosperity and not hopefully struggling with a lot of chronic illness and disease. So um, that's what we're sharing. We, Kim and I have been very blessed and fortunate to share this information through on TV, on documentaries and books and presentations like this. And we're just very blessed and honored to be able to share this information with uh, any and all that are out there that are struggling. And we've seen thousands upon thousands of people do the same thing that we've done. So it is possible. We're not any more special than any one of you out there watching this or listening to this now. And uh, we know that it works. So uh, Kim, we're, we're Food for Life instructors with Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. As I mentioned, we've been in uh, several books and documentaries. And actually this one here, this is a documentary that, um, that's coming out and should be out within a month or two, more or less. Here's, a, here's an actual trailer. I'm gonna play this and then uh, Olivia, let me know if you all can hear it. I hope that you can. And uh, it's only like two, two and a half minutes, not, not any more than three. But here's a quick, uh, quick review or a view of this official trailer. So let's see if we can't get this to play. Hi, my name is Adam Sud. My name is Mary Snyder. My name is David Bridges. I'm Marcy Midred. I'm 40 years old. I didn't know what was happening to me. My hair started falling out. My fingers swelled up. Pus started coming out of my face. I woke up on the floor of my apartment in a puddle of vomit, pile of fast food garbage, surrounded by empty pill bottles. My liver was shutting down. My kidneys were shutting down. Evidence is not enough. The science is not enough. You're just given pills and procedures and operations which have nothing to do with the causation of the disease, which is why these patients never get cured. 
Our medical system never inspires hope. In fact, we often tell people it's only going to get worse. We'll have to add more medications. When my doctor told me that I would be on insulin the rest of my life, I was devastated. I didn't want to lose him. I thought it was just in his genes. She won't be able to have my children. She's not going to be able to grow old with me. And she's going to have to need my physical help. I went from being an active runner to hobbling around, wearing orthotic shoes. Losing your toes and your foot and your lower leg. My cholesterol was 494 and my triglycerides were 3,295, so I think you need to have triple bypass. I was in shock. I started crying. If the medication route made me feel like that, it couldn't get much better. Any other option had to give us more hope. There is a way that they can take control of their own lives and reverse disease in their body. He was horrified that I would not choose to have surgery. I started learning, oh my gosh, there's stuff that I'm doing, so I can do this without being on this medication if I just clean up my diet. I could hear every single cell of my body say, man, we've been waiting your whole life for this. I'm doing this because it gave me the hope that I never had. I have zero desire to go back to my old lifestyle. I have now been lupus-free for 16 years. It was the best decision I ever made in my life. I'm eight years off medications. Just living in vibrant health. One of the best decisions I ever made. You can do it. So that's just a little preview, you know, it's the official trailer. It's again, uh, you know, re Disease Reversal Hope or Dr. Hope, uh, but it's pretty cool. It's coming out and has a lot of uh, hopefully inspirational testimonials, including ours. And uh, hopefully you'll be on the lookout for that. I don't have the exact date, otherwise I would share it, but I know it's coming out soon in the next month or two. So with that, you know, I shared the why we do what we do. Now I'm going to get it, give it over to the the pro at how we do what we do. So, can right. we So, we eat from four main food groups, and that's legumes. Legumes are anything that grow in a pod, fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. We also have about a handful of nuts and seeds each day, and that's where we get our healthy, healthy omega-3 fatty acids. And here are some examples of some dishes we made at home and we're sharing with our family and friends. Up in the corner there, you see Mexican one-pot quinoa. That recipe is on our website. Uh, our website's chickpeaandbean.com. You can find many more recipes there. Uh, that's a real quick, easy one. Our son is in his 20s now. He lives alone, and this is one of his favorite dishes to make. It's really tasty, and he loves to make a big pot of it and use it throughout the week for dinners or take to work for lunch. Uh, we also eat kale now and a lot of greens like collard greens and mustard greens and turnip greens. Before we went plant-based, we really didn't eat kale. And, you know, we used to buy those big deli trays for parties. And sometimes as a garnish, they would have kale on the edges of it. And we used to kind of look at each other and pick up the leaf and say, I don't know what this is all about and throw it out, you know, when the party was over and save all the meat. But um, now that we eat plant-based, we love to steam or braise kale and greens, sprinkle it with some vinegar or lemon, and it's absolutely delicious. It makes you feel really energized and good inside. Um, next to that, you see our version of meatloaf. It's made with lentils and steak seasoning. It has a delicious balsamic ketchup glaze on top. That's one of our kids' favorite recipes from the website. And a little bit easier, next to that you see pasta with red sauce. We have this at least once a week. It's really simple. You can use a jarred sauce or make your own sauce, whatever appeals to you. But that's a real simple, healthy, easy meal. Down in the corner in the left there, you see a salad that our daughter made. Now our daughter, uh, lucky her, isn't worried about losing weight, so she indulges more in some of the higher fat plant-based foods like avocados and nut butters and things like that. So if you're not battling diabetes and you don't have to worry about losing weight, lucky you, you can indulge like she does and you can see she has some lovely avocado on her salad to make it nice and creamy. 
Next to that, you see oatmeal. Oatmeal is our go-to breakfast every morning. You can have it um, old-fashioned oats, steel-cut oats, whatever appeals to you. Oatmeal is really special. It has an antioxidant that you really can't find in any other food, so it's a great idea to have oatmeal at least a couple times a week. We love to do it every morning, and we use chia seeds, berries, bananas, almond milk to make a delicious, tasty bowl. Next to that, you see Mark's Everything Cookies. Uh, Mark has a sweet tooth, and uh, this is a delicious treat that's sweetened with bananas. It also has oats, chocolate chips, and um, a little vanilla in it, so that's a real tasty treat. If you have a sweet tooth, it really helps a lot, and yeah. you can feel good about eating it. Yeah, for sure. Now is a time when I like to talk about our system we refer to as good, better, best. Some people ask us if we cook from scratch all the time and we eat all organic all the time, locally grown, things like that. And the answer to that is no. In fact, when we first started out trying to go plant-based, all we ate was from the good category. So the good category, as you see here, would be some chickpeas or garbanzo beans that we bought at Aldi in this can. It cost about 60 cents and that's good. Okay, next to that you see butter. This is a product that's in a better container. It's low sodium, it's non-GMO and organic. And then on the right you see the best. That's locally grown uh, dried beans that you have to cook from scratch and they're non-GMO and organic. That's best. But if all you can do is the good category, that's okay. In fact, that's all we did at the beginning and Mark still had those amazing results in his health. Uh, we tell people when they go shopping to spend a lot of time in the produce department. It smells good, it looks beautiful, it's filled with color. And we found that when you go shopping, usually when you start, you spend more time. And as you get tired of shopping, you start to rush. So we like to start in the produce department because you might spend a little bit more time there and get some of those delicious, healthy fruits and veggies. And here are some examples that we pulled out of our cupboard to show you some products that we buy. Um, you'll see oatmeal, some cream of wheats or grits, shredded wheat, grape nuts, and then some of the breads we enjoy. Dave's Killer Bread is really tasty and good. Our favorite brand is Food for Life Ezekiel Breads. Now you can find these in the freezer department because they don't have preservatives. So grocery stores often keep them frozen so they last longer. And those are also low glycemic. Uh, glyce the glycemic index is all about how fast your body breaks down the food and if your body can break down the food faster that means it might bump your blood sugar up too much so for people who are dealing with blood sugar issues they need to look for foods that are lower glycemic and the Ezekiel breads are great for that also uh, it's easy to find plant-based milks that are really tasty. We prefer almond milk that is vanilla and unsweetened, but there's oat milk, soy milk, hemp milk, all, all sorts of different milks. So uh, I suggest if it's new to you, try to get one vanilla flavored. Those are really delicious. And that's a great step in the right direction. Here you see some other things from our pantry. Um, you see different kinds of pasta. Regular pasta is fine, but you could also go for one of the pastas that's made from legumes, as you see here, like bonza pasta that's made from chickpeas. Those are loaded with protein. And when you put a delicious sauce on top, they taste really good. We also enjoy quinoa. Now, for people who are new to eating beans and legumes, um, sometimes it can take our bodies a, a while to adjust to eating those things, but quinoa is a little bit easier in our digestive system. So if beans are new to you, I'd say start slow. Start with maybe a quarter cup at a time. Go for the legumes that are smaller, like split peas or lentils, and also look to quinoa. Quinoa cooks up easily, sort of like rice, and it's packed with protein. Uh, next to that, you see brown rice, and a bag of flat ground flaxseed from Aldi. Um, if you're 
getting your omega-3s from flaxseed, please realize you need to eat ground flaxseed or flaxseed meal or grind them up yourself in a coffee grinder because flaxseeds are really beneficial with those omega fatty acids. But if you don't eat them ground up, they sort of come out of your body the same way they went in. Your body can't break them open and you can't reap the benefits of those omegas. So make sure they're ground up. And lastly, on the end, you see vegetable stock. Now, because we are doing low fat, we try to cut out oil. And instead of sauteing vegetables in oil, I use water or vegetable stock or vegetable broth. It's really easy to do and, and a simple way to cut down on the fat that we're consuming. And um, you know what, maybe at this point, do you wanna explain why it's important to watch fat intake yeah, with so, diabetes? So one of the main causes of uh, insulin resistance is too much fat inside our muscle cells and tissue. So it's called intramyocellular lipid, or basically fat inside your muscle cells and tissues. And if our diet consists of a lot of fat, that's where those muscle cells and tissues get so consumed with fat that as the insulin, the hormone insulin, is trying to take the glucose out of our blood and inject it into our muscle cells and tissues to be used as energy, that the muscle cells and tissues say, hey, I got plenty of energy. I'm full of fat, plenty of energy here to burn off, keep that glucose in the blood. And that's where slowly but surely people's blood glucose levels start to rise. And, and that's where they start to get in trouble with higher blood glucose levels. So. If you are struggling with diabetes, that one of the best things you can do is try to eat, uh, you know, plant-based for sure, but then low in fat as well. Now, if you don't have diabetes, and you don't have to be as concerned, but if you're struggling with weight or, you know, you, you it is a good idea to not eat a ton of fat, really, of any right. kind. So mm -hmm. th that's the process. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for explaining all that. Um, here you see some meat substitute products or plant-based meats. These aren't necessary, but if you find yourself missing meat, uh, they can really be a great food to transition. One of my favorites is up there in the corner. It's called Light Life Smart Ground. It's very similar to ground beef. And if you flavor it up with spices, maybe steak sauce or barbecue sauce, it's it's a really good transition food. Yeah, many many of our meetings, Kim has made a, our sloppy joes that are on our recipe, are on our website. Uh, but she uses this, and they're fantastic. Uh, we get a lot of great reviews uh, with our sloppy joes using this product. So. Right, and um, yeah, so try those sloppy joes if you're missing meat, like our son did in the beginning. He really was missing when I was, you know, making more plant based things at home. But he loved this recipe, so that came in real handy. And some of the other things you see there are jackfruit. Jackfruit is actually a fruit. And when you um, pull apart the flesh inside the fruit, it's very shreddy, sort of like pulled pork or chicken. And if you, again, if you put it with a delicious sauce, it, it's really satisfying. Um, now, a lot of people, when they switch to eating plant-based, they start eating more salads and that's wonderful. But please be aware, if you are putting a lot of fatty salad dressings on your salad, it's sort of like taking one step forward and two steps back. So some suggestions for low-fat salad dressings are simply balsamic vinegar. You can get balsamic vinegar in delicious flavors. Like one of my favorites is maple syrup balsamic vinegar. It tastes absolutely delicious. Um, you could also try seasoned rice vinegar. That's usually in the Asian section at grocery stores. It has a little bit of salt and sugar in it. And it just by itself, it tastes nice and light on top of a salad. One of my favorite things to do is mix, mix a little seasoned rice vinegar with a little apple juice or a little orange juice. That's really tangy, low fat and delicious on a salad. And then make your salads into more of a substantial meal that are gonna fill you up and, and so you don't get hungry right away. An easy way to do that is simply take a can of chickpeas or any sort of bean you like, rinse it off and scatter them on top of your salad. That tastes really good. Hummus is also a great dressing yep. or a great throw, dollop on the side. Yeah. You throw them in a wrap, right? Throw the veggies yeah. in a wrap. and uh, Make yeah, it more good. of a sandwich. Yeah, good stuff. Here is a picture of our cart from Aldi. A lot of people ask us if Eating this way is expensive, and the answer to that is no. In fact, 
we found that we save about 30% on our groceries now that we eat plant-based. And if you consider the amount of money we're saving on prescriptions, medicines, and doctor visits. Best, we, best guess is it's about $22,000 we've saved in this decade of no medications, far fewer doctor visits. Uh, I mean, it, about $22,000 and we've put in our pockets instead of giving away to you know, medications and doctor visits, co-pays, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but of course, it's like any, any style of eating, depending on what you choose, you could spend a lot of money or not, depending on what you choose at the grocery store. If you're going to choose a lot of special fancy vegan cheeses or pre-made frozen meals, you could spend a lot of money. But we're going for foods that aren't as processed or more pure, um, simple things like what we were showing you in those slides, brown rice, pasta, fresh fruits and veggies that are in season, potatoes, dried beans, those even a can of beans at all these only 60 cents. It's very inexpensive. Yeah. And of course, what this this we must have had a good amount of fruit because that first photo that we showed you of the produce section, we always have a ton of fruit in our house, a bunch of greens, a bunch of fruit, mm -hmm. um, all, you know, sprouts, I mean, all kinds of stuff. So Please know that, you know, I know you see some uh, cans and boxes here, but we have a ton of fruit and a ton of greens and vegetables as well. And also frozen fruits and vegetables are a great idea. Yeah. Um, they're, they're quick and easy because they're often already washed and already cut up. And also there's less waste because it stays frozen until you're ready to use it so things don't spoil. And um, they really are very nutritious too. Yeah. Uh, I want to share this quote with you. It's from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and it reads that appropriately planned vegetarian, including vegan diets, are healthful, nutritionally adequate, and provide health benefits in the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. These diets are appropriate for all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, childhood, adolescence, older adulthood, and for athletes. Um, and you may have noticed in the news that a lot of athletes have discovered this way of eating helps them perform better. It um, helps them recover faster too. There's a documentary out called The Game Changers that really dives into this subject. So if you're an athlete or know anyone who's an athlete who wants an edge in the competition, check that out. Um, and I wanted to just briefly tell a little bit about our family experience because you heard a lot about Mark's health issues. But as our son was growing up, he had terrible digestive issues, especially constipation to the point where we thought he had a condition called Hirschsprung syndrome. And he had to have things like barium enemas and he really suffered a lot from pain and embarrassment too. Uh, we figured out years later, the problem was dairy products. And when he went plant-based as we were going along our journey, all those issues cleared up. So if you know anybody struggling with digestive issues, um, it could be dairy. Dairy is very hard for us to digest. And um, a lot of people are lactose intolerant. That wasn't the case with our son because we checked for that, but still the dairy was troublesome for him. And then our daughter um, had severe cystic acne when she was about 20. When she went away to college, it really got bad. It took us a while to figure out, but what she was doing was eating a lot of yogurt. And yogurt is heavily marketed to females as a health food. Um, unfortunately, it's not a health food. Dairy products contain hormones. Uh, the cows naturally make hormones. It, the dairy products are filled with estrogen. And the purpose of that is to help the calf grow into a huge cow very quickly in a matter of months. The problem for humans is all those hormones aren't good for us. And it can cause things um, like problems with cycles, problems with acne too. So when she got away from eating all that, dairy yogurt her skin cleared up and here's a picture of her on her wedding day with a nice clear complexion yeah so our website chickpeaandbean.com that's our website there's a lot of recipes and information uh, regarding certain classes we host etc we're always doing events like this with the wonderful veg michigan as well uh, and uh, that, that's our website you can follow us uh, on, obviously at our website but we're also on facebook instagram and twitter those are our handles there. Kim also puts out a quarterly, um, about a quarterly 
a newsletter that's free, no charge for it, just talks about events, things going on, maybe some recipes, etc. So you can sign up for that right off of our website. And I promise you, we sometimes when you sign up for these things, people start bombarding you every day or multiple times a day. I promise you, we're not going to do that to you because we don't like it when it happens to us. So we are not ones to do that. Uh, but go ahead and sign up for that free newsletter and uh, let us know, you know, what you think. So I hope this was helpful. And at this point, Karen and uh, Olivia, we, we can open it up if there's any questions or anything we can help address or answer when it, as it pertains to our journey. We're more than happy to help. We do have a couple questions so far. Someone asked, uh, what is a good source of vitamin B12 other than a vitamin? Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so B12 is a bacteria. It's not made by cows or chickens or pigs. It's a bacteria that's from the soil. And so really, when you look at the, you know, the animal agriculture, they are pumped full of B12, which is why when you go and eat meat, you get B12 but it is not made by cows, chickens, or pigs. It's a bacteria. And so the way we get it is through a supplement. It's very cheap. Uh, really, the recommendation is about 2,000 micrograms per week. And really, you can buy, you can find them at Kroger, at any, all of the CVS, Walgreens. It's available everywhere. So we supplement just like they supplement the cows, the pigs, and the chicken. We just take a little supplement, very easy. You can buy them in different dosages. They have, you know, 250 micrograms, 500, 1,000. Uh, so we, I pop one a couple of times a week. And, and the cool thing about B12 is as you take this supplement, you know, every so often, uh, you, it, it's stored in our body for a long period of time. So it's not like if you go on vacation for a week, oh my gosh, I forgot my B12. You don't need to worry about it. You just want to make sure you're getting it in on a regular basis. And again, the goal is approximately 2,000 micrograms. Mm -hmm. And uh, go But ahead. some foods that have it are, um, one of my favorites is Nutri or Nutritional Yeast. That's uh, usually fortified with B12. Make sure to check the label, but most are fortified with all sorts of B vitamins, especially B12. And nutritional yeast is excellent if you find yourself missing cheese. It has like a sharp, tangy flavor that tastes sort of like cheddar cheese. I love to sprinkle it on popcorn or on top of soup or cooked veggies. Tastes really good. Also, a lot of plant-based milks are fortified with B12. Just check the labels. Not all of them are, but a lot are. So yeah. those are some other sources to get B12. Yeah, hope that helped. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely recommend nutritional yeast to anyone who's not tried it so far. I put it on many things. <laughs> um, yeah. Let me see. Okay, someone asked if you limit your consumption of chia seeds. Um, I have about two tablespoons of chia seeds a day. Sometimes I sprinkle it on... Uh, my oatmeal in the morning. Other times I put it in a smoothie. Um, the reason that we try to keep nuts and seeds to about two tablespoons a day is because, first of all, I'm trying to keep my weight down. Nuts and seeds are like little fat bombs, um, so I don't want to have too many. But if that isn't an issue for you, you're very blessed and go ahead and have a lot more. Also, people that are struggling with diabetes need to watch the fat intake, so that's why Mark watches it and keeps it to about two tablespoons a day. Yep. So it depends on your personal situation. And quite honestly, for me, uh, I know Kim loves chia seeds. For mm -hmm. me, I, you know, I floss every day. I brush my teeth two, three times a day. But a week later, I swear I'm popping a seed out, <laughs> out of my mouth. So I, they just get stuck all in my teeth. And I'm like, you know what? So I stick with the flax seed, maybe some walnuts as good sources of my omega-3s. Uh, but chia seed is, again, another great source of omega-3s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and on that line, uh, someone said you mentioned flax seed has to be ground. Do chia seeds need to be ground as well? No, no, chia seeds don't need to be. Uh, they can be if you like them that way or like if you put them in a smoothie, they're going to blind up, you know, grind up on their own in the smoothie. But it's really um, not necessary with chia seeds. All right. Um, Gina asked, how long did it take for the weight loss? And did you eat good fats like avocados and processed foods? Uh, example, like processed meat crumbles or something like that. And she also said, thank you for your time and info. Yeah. So first of all, you're welcome. Our yeah, pleasure. it is our pleasure. So my weight loss, 
I it, when I started this journey, now keep in mind, I was a fast food junkie. I'm running through McDonald's. I'm running to Pizza Hut, Kentucky Fried Chicken. I mean, Five Guys, all of these fast food restaurants. And when I go back and reflect on how much fat I was eating, you know, I'd stop every morning and get two of the, you know, the two for three or two for four breakfast sandwiches along with the, you know, along with the, the sausage, egg and cheese, bacon, egg and cheese, whatever it is. And then, of course, I'd get the hash browns and and uh, when I go back and look at the fat content and how much, you know, grease and just, it was an ungodly amount of fat that I was eating every day in all these foods. And it's no wonder when I reflect back on why I was so sick, because I would eat those foods very, very often. And so when we, when I first jumped in this lifestyle, coming from this fast food junkie lifestyle, I mean, I, my weight, I lost 50 pounds in three months. And so I was 260 when I started this journey, I lost 50 pounds in three months, which hopefully you remember the photo of me standing there with the, the big pants. The majority of it came off right around my waist, but I also lost some around my fingers, my face, my toes. You know, I could feel a difference all over. And so that happened. And then here with COVID here, you know, we're working from home for the last two years. And I'm not going out to, you know, the vegan restaurants and this and that. We're eating at home. Kim's making more food here. And so I lost another 15-ish or so pounds. Uh, I'm sitting at about 196 pounds, which uh, is a great weight for me. I feel very comfortable. Um, but that's that's what I experienced. Now, Kim also lost some weight as well. Yeah, um, I think a big factor in it for Mark was because he ate so um, so poorly really before we went plant-based that he saw a huge difference right away um, for people who are eating more healthfully they're not going to see as dramatic of a change but um, I lost about 10 pounds and it took me probably about 10 months to lose 10 pounds but I was already at my um, normal weight so yeah. that's why that happened that way yeah but Kim keep in mind folks I'm 6'2 Kim's 5'4", right? And and she's small to begin with already. I mean, she's she's at a perfect weight for me. I mean, I love her the way she is. But but mm -hmm. uh, but I, can I tell him your weight? No, she'll kill me if I tell you. <laughs> it's it's low. It's not much over a hundred pounds, folks. Just so you know. So, but so. yeah, and it's important, you know, to be a, a good healthy weight. But eating this way for us, it was more about um, getting healthier and reversing his chronic disease than about weight loss uh, we we're really focusing on trying to get healthy yeah and you can do it too i promise you I, if you would have told me 10 years ago hey mark you're never going to eat meat again you know coming from a big mexican family all those foods we ate the tortillas the beans the all the steak all the chicken all the i mean i would have told you you're nuts there's no way i'm doing this but lo and behold when i when i see all these medications i see the devastation all this illness caused to me and and when i'm thinking about I'm gonna be blind. I'm gonna, I'm gonna need Kim to help me. I'm gonna I'm gonna they're gonna amputate my leg. I'm gonna need kidney. And I'm looking at not only is that gonna affect me, but Kim, my children, my future, my so there's just no way that that those foods are more important than what the future, my future health holds for us. And and uh, that's what really you know um, I guess for me is now we're on this journey where the the future looks bright. It doesn't look dim anymore because. We've been a decade without medications, a decade of the weight not coming back. And guess what? We eat a lot of food. When people spend time with us, they're like, you're going to eat again? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm hungry. We don't count calories. We don't portion control. We eat until we're comfortably full. But all these plant foods are perfectly packaged by Mother Nature to be low in fat. And so as long as you, you, know, you learn some tips and tricks, you, you're doing great. So great, really. You're you're both very inspirational. We all really appreciate you uh, sharing your personal story. It means a lot. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, back to the B12 real quick. Um, someone asked if they should be getting a blood test to test for their B12 to see how they're doing. It's really the only way to know, right? Mm -hmm. We don't. We won't know unless your doctor runs the test and tells you, "Hey, you're high. Hey, you're low." And keep in mind, if we if we think about some of our friends and loved ones and family, there are many people that do eat meat and animal products, and they need B12 shots too. As we age, our body has a more difficult time, you know, um, absorbing the B12, which is why you see many people as they get older, they need B12 shots. You might have heard of some of your friends or family or loved ones. So, so yeah, the bottom line is um, make sure that you get it, that you are tested for that. 
Um, and usually if you're just popping that 2,000 micrograms per week, probably most people are going to be okay, but mm -hmm. it's, you won't know unless your doctor tests you. So I would absolutely ask your, your doctor, your physician to make sure they run a test probably once a year and then just based on the results, go from there. Absolutely. Okay, we are at 7.30. It looks like there's just one more question um, and then we can wrap up. As someone said, quinoa, is all types good for protein or is there one kind in particular, like there's red, white, tricolor quinoa? Oh, you know, it's always good to eat a variety. All those different colors are different antioxidants, but they're all good with protein. Yep, yep. yep. Eat the one that you enjoy most. Yeah. Try them all and mm -hmm. then pick the one you like most. But like Kim said, we want that biodiversity, all these different colors, all the different, you know, the reds, the yellows, the greens, the purples. They all have different antioxidants, different minerals and vitamins that all help uh, us, our bodies just thrive with all these wonderful nutrients. So you can do it. I promise you. If we can do it, anybody can yeah, do it. Yeah, you can yeah. do it. We are no more special than any one of you watching this presentation. I mm -hmm. promise you. You can do it. And, and you know what? It's not about being perfect. You, if there's a few mishaps along the way, you stumble a little bit, you fumble a couple of times, that's okay. Just don't stop trying. Keep going. And ultimately, you will find your way.